stand and sing, count your blessings.
trust and obey.
Who could use some encouragement this morning? Amen. Let's turn to, we're going to take a break from Revelation today. Let's turn to Luke chapter 15. I want to, and I know some of you have already looked at the bulletin and seen that we're going to cover all 32 verses of chapter 15, and you're thinking, oh no, we're going to be here all day. But, you know, normally I take a few, a few, a few verses and we go like scuba diving and go deep and, and try to figure out what, what's going on, you know, in each individual verse and, and all that. But today, instead of scuba diving, we're going to go water skiing, okay? So we're, just, we're going to hit the highlights. And so don't worry about the time. Just, just get caught up in this passage because this is a, a great passage that shows our Father's love for us. Uh, and uh, I've actually entitled this message, The Prodigal of God. And why in the world would I do that? You say, well, you know, the, all my life I've heard this called the prodigal son. Well, the word prodigal is kind of an archaic word. It, it means somebody who is extravagant, somebody who's a spendthrift, uh, who just, you know, is, is spends wastefully. Well, isn't that what the father does when the son comes home? Right? So it's really the, the prodigal God. And then we're going to learn about the prodigal God this morning. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. Now, b before I read this, I want to point out you need to pay extra special attention to verses 1 and 2. Because you have to understand verses 1 and 2 to understand all of these parables. Okay? And we're just going to very briefly talk about the, the lost sheep and the lost coin. And we'll get into these two sons and their father. All right? Uh, chapter 15, verse 1. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near uh, to him to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable, saying, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I tell you that in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, if she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And he said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the, the best robe 
and put it on him. They put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, your brother has come. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I've been serving you and I've never neglected a command of yours. And yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came... Who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes you killed the fattened calf for him and he said to him son you have always been with me and all that is mine is yours but we had to celebrate and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live he was lost and has been found heavenly father we ask your blessing upon the, the reading and the teaching of your word this morning I ask that you would uh, give us your grace and your mercy and, and give me the words to say this morning as I proclaim your word and help us to have ears to hear, hearts to obey. We just thank you so much for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. As I mentioned, the word uh, prodigal describes somebody who's a, a spendthrift, who's uh, extravagantly indulgent and, and wasteful maybe to, you know to the point of being wasteful and so the setting for these parables is here is you know, these tax collectors and these sinners were coming to Jesus to listen to him and, and they were getting saved and, and Jesus was spending time with them eating and drinking with them and, and having all kinds of you know, spending all kinds of time with them, and, and, and guess who didn't like it? The religious crowd, right? Uh, the, these Pharisees and these scribes, they didn't like it that he's receiving sinners and eating with them, and, you know, he, he's, he's partying it up with these sinners. And so Jesus tells these three parables to uh, really address the Pharisees' attitude toward what Jesus is doing and toward his ministry. And, and what we find here in this passage, in this chapter, is that Jesus rejoices over sinners who repent and are saved by grace. But those who refuse to embrace the ministry of Jesus will miss the celebration. Uh, these first two parables really just tell us about God's uh, seeking and saving mission. You know, God's seeking and saving the lost is, is reason for celebration you get he, he tells these first two parables and we see some repetition in these parables uh, we see that something is lost and then found in, in verses 15 uh, in verse 3 i'm sorry verse 3 and 4 and 8 uh, where it says you know uh, so he told them this parable saying what man among you if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them does he not leave the ninety and nine in, in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. And then he, in the parable of the lost coin, the pattern repeats. Uh, or, or what woman, if she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? You see, that, that's what God did when he sent Jesus from heaven, his son. He sent Jesus on a search and rescue mission because humanity, apart from God, is lost. We've all gone our own way. We've all rebelled against God. And the Bible tells us that we are all sinners. And so God sent His Son Jesus on a search and rescue mission to save lost people. And He came and He, he lived a sinless life. And He died on the cross for our sins. And He was raised again the third day. And if we put our faith and our trust in Him as our Lord and Savior, then, then we can receive that salvation. We, we've been rescued. We're, we're part of this uh, found. And, and you see, once He finds us, here's the second part of the pattern, 
There's, there's recovery and there's joy. In verses 5 and 6 and verse 9, over the lost sheep in verse 5, when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which was lost. And then in verse uh, uh, 9, when, he, when she has found it, speaking of the lost coin, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the coin which I had lost. By the way, that was a valuable coin. We're not talking about a quarter here, okay? It was a valuable coin. <laughs> Alright. And so she there, there's this pattern. God sends Jesus on this search and rescue mission to find lost sinners, and he finds them in these tax collectors and, and these uh, other people who are not part of the religious elite, and, and he rescues them. And and there's rejoicing when he rescues them. And there's even heavenly rejoicing. Look at verse 7 and verse 10. I tell you that in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. In verse 10, in the same way I tell you there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. One person comes to Jesus today and in, at the end of this service there will be rejoicing in heaven. So, so you see the pattern. Something's lost, it gets found, there's rejoicing, even rejoicing in heaven. That's those first two parables, right? Something's lost, it gets found, there's rejoicing. Well, in the, in the, in the, in the third parable, with the two sons and the father, the pattern's a little different. There's something that's lost, it gets found, there's rejoicing, and somebody gets angry. See the difference? That, that's what he's addressing. If you paid attention to those first two verses, these, these Pharisees and these scribes, they were upset over what Jesus was doing. But Jesus, when, he, when he's beginning to tell this parable, uh, he, he, look at the desperate condition of those uh, who are saved. It, that magnifies the joy of the celebration. He's, he's telling the, the Pharisees and the scribes, when he's talking about this younger son, he's talking about these tax collectors. It, it represents these tax collectors, these, these sinners who are not part of the religious elite. That's who he's talking about. He's saying, guys, you just don't understand their desperate situation. Look at them. They, they, they represent people who were sick of home. You ever get sick of home? Growing up, think this, you know, something's got to be better out there than what I'm living here at home, right? You ever get that way? That's what happens to him in verse 11 and 12. This said this man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth among them. You know, what, you know what this younger son represents? It's people who think they would be better off without God. You know, God, I, I really, Father, I just really don't want you to be a part of my life right now. I, I want to do my own thing. I don't really like living under your rules and your regulations. So, uh, could you just go ahead and, and give me my inheritance right now? Do you know what he's saying when he says to his father, give, give me the share of the estate that falls to me? He's saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. I'd be better off. He, there are people who, who, who want absolutely nothing to do with God. And, and, and maybe, or, or maybe just enough to have the common graces that he gives, like the, the rain and the sun and things like that. But they certainly don't want to be held accountable for God's moral law. And so, Dad, I wish you were dead. Can you just go ahead and give me my inheritance? And so his father, you know, if you want to live that way, God will let you live that way. If you want to live like there is no God, God will let you live that way. 
And so he, he gathers everything. He gets his inheritance. He, he liquidates everything. And he goes into this distant country. He, 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 instead of sick at home, we see he, he gets sick. He liquidates. He goes to the far country. Why would he go to a far country? Be, be away from the Father, right? Be away from anybody that will remind him of his Father. I don't want to live under my dad's rules and I don't want to be around where people are going to shame me for not living under my dad's rules. I don't, I don't want to live under God's rules and I don't want to be around anybody that's going to shame me for, for not living under God's rules and authority. And so he, he goes away into this far country. It says that he has, he, he, he's, um, he squandered his estate with loose living. He, he's living as though God is dead. You, you all know Psalm 14.1, at least the verse, first part of the verse that says, um, the fool has said in his heart, what? There is no God. See, that, that verse is not talking about atheism. When Psalm 14 was written, atheism would have been unknown. What he's talking about is somebody who's living as if God's existence doesn't really matter. And that's what this younger son is doing. He, he's living as if God's existence doesn't matter. Frederick Nietzsche, who, who was an atheist philosopher in the 19th century, uh, he, he wrote this parable where this madman comes into this village. And, and Nietzsche, this, in this parable, he's an atheist and he's cr uh, critiquing these other atheists not realizing what they have done by saying that God is dead. And so here comes this madman into the village and he says, God is dead. God remains dead and we have killed him. We, we shall, how shall we comfort ourselves? The murderers of all murderers. What was holiest and mightiest of all that the world has yet owned has bled to death under our knives and who will wipe his blood off of us? And what Nietzsche was getting at in this parable was that if there is no God, there's no such thing as objective morality. And the atheists of his day had not realized that yet. They, they didn't realize what, that what they had done by claiming there is no God. They were, they were claiming there is no God and yet they were, they were borrowing morality from Christianity because that was just their culture. And what we've seen over the last century is what one of my professors called a cut flower morality. Where we, you know, we, we just decided that we didn't want God to be with us anymore, but, but we, we like to keep his values and his, his morals around and everything. But as time goes on, we see, well, if, if there's no God, there's really no reason to keep his morals and, and our, our morals are like that cut flower. And what happens over time to a flower that's been cut and put in a vase of water? It dies. It begins to wither and wilt away. And that's what's happened to our, our morality is, is we've become like this younger son in society. We've, we've, we've cut off God and his uh, morality. And we've gone our own way into the far country. And this, then it says that he squanders everything. He becomes impoverished. You see, you see, living as if God doesn't matter, it will leave you living a spiritually impoverished life. You, you don't know the blessings that are yours in God. You, th this young man in this parable, he, he didn't understand his father. He thought his father was a slave driver. He thought his father just wanted, you know, just wanted him to live by this set of rules and, and, and be a good person and, and, and be obedient all the time, not realizing the grace and the mercy of his father. And that his father just wanted a, 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 a relationship with him. And so this, this living as if God is dead, you know, he, he goes and he, he, he becomes impoverished. 
in verse 14. And in verse 15, he, he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country. Then he sent him into the fields to feed the swine. You know, the, the Pharisees probably listening to the parable at this point, and, and they're going, good, he's getting just what he deserves. Anybody treat his father like that? Well, that's what he deserves. He'd be out there feeding the pigs and going hungry. Nobody was giving to him. And he is in spiritual bondage. Where, where it says there that he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, it, it, it literally means that he glued himself to that person. He, he was in bondage. He couldn't get away from, from the, the life that he had uh, done, basically gotten himself into. You, you, you know that saying, you, 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 you make your bed, now lay in it. Well, he, he was stuck in the bed. He couldn't get out of it until something happens. He got homesick. Verse 17 says, but when he came to his senses. See, what's happened here is, you know, the, the spiritual blindness has been lifted. God, God has lifted his spiritual blindness and, and had mercy upon him and, and allowed him to see the glorious graciousness of his father. He, he's allowing him to see what his father is really like. Look, look at what he says about his father. How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread but I'm dying here with hunger. You see, he, he finally, in, when he's, he gets to the rock bottom, he finally realizes what his father is like, that he's a gracious father, and that even his father's hired servants have enough bread to spare. See, see he, 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 his spiritual eyes have been opened. He, he has what I want to call a, a Sermon on the Mount experience. If you remember the Beatitudes, when we were preaching through the Sermon on the Mount, those first four Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He, he declared spiritual bankruptcy. He said, I've, you know, Father, he's, he's rehearsing this speech, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm not even worthy to be called your son. There he's, he's declaring his spiritual bankruptcy. He's not worthy to even be his father's son. He confesses his sinfulness. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. He's sorry for his sinfulness. Blessed are the gentle or, or the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. He, he, he begins to think, well, I'm going to go back home and surrender my, my life. To my father, I'll just be one of his servants. But I'll I'll, I'll surrender my my life and, and be meek under my father. And then blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they should be satisfied. He wants a right relationship with his father again. You see, that's that's a work of the Holy Spirit that to open up the eyes of this son and help him to come to his senses and just let him become homesick so that he goes back to the father. But look at the, the compassion of God that initiates a celebration. Verse uh, uh, 20 look, and 21, look at the reception that he gives. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Here's the father. Obviously, he's watching for his son to come home because he loves him. And he wants that relationship with him. But, you know, he, he had to let him go because that's the way he wanted to go. But now he's, he's looking for his father and he sees him coming from a long way off. You know, if you've got children, you can tell your, your children walk. You don't have to see them very clearly right you can just tell by the way they walk that it's your child right uh, and, and that's what this father does and he does something that's very shameful you see old men 
in the Bible, it was very shameful for them to run. It was undignified. And so he he pulled up, he had to pull up his robe. Now, if I was if that was me, you'd see some my, my legs would probably put your eyes out, you know, because of the brightness. And, and you gotta look at this this old man, he pulls up his robe and he ties it around his waist and he takes off running to, to catch his son. Why does he want to catch him before he gets into the village? What if this what if this younger son ran into his older brother first? What if this older son ran into some of the villagers? So he's coming in to the village. What are you, what are you doing here? You, you don't need to be coming around here. You've shamed your father. You've, you've embarrassed your father. Your father doesn't want to see you. The father knows that. And so he takes off running for him. Embraces him. Kisses him. The, the, the tense of, of the verb there is, is, is he's kissing him over and over again. He just keeps on kissing his face. He, 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 look at this reception, this reconciliation that he has with the Father. Romans chapter 4 and verse 5 says, But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is credited as righteousness. You see, his, his father cuts him off before he can finish his speech, right? He said, does, he, does he get out the part about, let me be one of your hired servants? No, he doesn't. The father cuts him off before he can get to that part because... You can't earn your way to acceptance with God. It's by grace. Look, look at the reception that he gets. He, he took the shame for his son. If his son had come into the village first, he would have faced the shame. But his father took the shame by running to meet him. And instead of saying, okay, you're going to have to get a job, you're going to have to pay back everything that you took because, you know, now my estate's smaller because of all the things that you took. You're going to have to work and pay all that back. And if you do that, then I'll receive you as my son. No, none of that. What does he do? Calls a servant. But verse 22, but the father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found and they began to celebrate. What grace. What mercy. No works. You don't have to pay anything back. Bring, bring my best robe. Put it on him. You know that robe that I wear at the best occasions? Put that on him. My, my signet ring that shows my authority. Give that to him too. Sandals. You know, slaves go barefoot, but he's a son, so he's going to wear sandals. Put some sandals on his feet. And he receives him by grace. And then there's rejoicing. And, and, and the, the rejoicing over this lost son, I mean, it dwarfs the rejoicing over the sheep and the coin, does it not? I mean, instead of just calling your friends together, this is a whole, whole village rejoicing. You know, I, I, I may not, you know, if I lived in that village, I may not have a very high opinion of this man's son, but he, he's got barbecue. So I'm going to go to the celebration. Right? There's rejoicing. The whole village gathered together. Because his father is rejoicing. Then you, you get this older son. And what we find out from this older son is that those who refuse to embrace the ministry of Jesus are going to miss the celebration. 
You see, this is where this parable's been going the whole time, is to this older son. Because he, he's like these Pharisees that were upset that Jesus was talking to tax collectors and sinners. And he has this legalistic reaction. Now it says in verse 15, or sorry, verse 25, Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring, what of these things could be? And he said to him, your, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he's received him back safe and sound. Look at this reaction. He became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, look, for so many years I've been serving you. And I've never neglected a command of yours, and yet you've never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came and who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. What self-righteous indignation. Never? You, you, you've, you've never neglected a command of God? Can anybody here say that? You've never neglected a command of God. Man, this, this, this older brother is really full of himself. And, and it shows you just what he thinks of his father too. He, 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 he was a hypocrite legalist is what he was. He was doing what was expected of him on the outside but inwardly, he was filled with bitterness and hatred and jealousy, anger and lust. He, he's treating his father as, you know, his opinion was no different than his younger brother's. It was just his reaction was different. Instead of, you know, the younger brother was like, well, my dad's a slave driver. I'm going to get out of here. Well, the older brothers, I'm going to, my dad's a slave driver, but I'm going to live by all of his rules so everybody can see how good a person I am. He's just as lost as the younger brother. Jesus later talking to the Pharisees and, and the religious leaders, he says so in verse Matthew 23, 28 says, so you too outwardly appear righteousness to men, but inwardly you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. You see, this older brother, he has a Sermon on the Mount moment too. And it's not a good one. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, Jesus is talking on the final day of, about the final day of judgment. And here's this old... Here, here's this older brother standing on the final day of judgment. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You say, now wait a minute. This brother's not been practicing lawlessness. He's been obeying his father. He's been out in the field working, doing all that he's supposed to do. He's been following all the rules. He has externally. There's one problem. If you look at the Ten Commandments, which are the Father's rules, right? Right? What happens when you get to that last commandment? You know what you know what the tenth commandment is, right? You shall not covet. That was the commandment that just got the apostle Paul. He he, he said, "I was doing great until I hit that tenth commandment." What what is coveting? It, it, you see, coveting is an internal attitude. Can you measure coveting by external factors? No. 
You see, God will not just hold you accountable on judgment day for what you do externally or physically with your body. He's going to hold you accountable for all that you wanted to do. Coveting is, is what you want to do. And if you use that standard, then the older brother, he's, he's lawless. He's, he's not practicing righteousness. He said, only those who do the will of my Father. Well, what's the will of the Father? To repent and believe in Jesus. That he, he's full of the self-righteousness. He viewed his relationship with his father as slavery. You, you see, both sons misunderstand the father. And the father has to come out to both sons. And get them to come home. And so it, it could be this morning... Just like the father ran out to meet the younger son, he needs to come out and meet you. He's, he's meeting you here this morning. Welcoming you home. Offering his, his loving grace and mercy to you this morning. Or, or maybe you're like the older brother and, and you think that you're just, you know, you live a good life and you're going to be okay. Well, God's coming out to meet you this morning to let you know that you're just as, as lost as, as anybody else. You see, it's, it's possible to be in close proximity to God and be more lost than any sinner in the far country. We don't know what the older brother finally did, do we? The story ends, you know, we, we, before we find out if the older brother changes his mind and comes in or, or if he stays out. And, and I think Jesus did that because each one of us is going to have to decide. Are we going to receive Jesus or are we going to stay outside and be lost? Are we going to miss the celebration that we could have if we come and surrender our hearts and lives to Him?